The very first time I had a beer, it was, I believe, a Bud Dry. <laughs> and that's probably not true for a whole lot of people, but it's part of my story, and I like it as someone who tests as an Enneagram 4. It's a unique first beer experience, the Bud Dry. It doesn't even exist anymore. At the time, beer pretty much only showed up at parties or in TV commercials, and there was never any talk about hops or malt or really any kind of conversation about beer and flavor outside of trying to sell it, much less between beer drinkers, which is to say that the culture around beer was thin, and that's not the case anymore. The most recent beer I had was last night, a neighborhood friend's birthday party where we tasted eight different beers from local breweries and talked about the differences in composition and flavor and complexity, the way people talk about wine or paintings or songs. Beer culture is a vital social space that, as a culture, provides a doorway into relationship and conversation even broader than wine and fine art, probably more like music, which is the thing I like most about the team at Harding House Brewery in Nashville and why it meant so much that among the many excellent beers they have brewed over the years and released, two of those beers are actually named after words I've written <laughs> it's like a legitimate career highlight to be included in their work that way. I got to sit down with them in Nashville a few weeks ago, and it was a delightful conversation. Check it out. So we're in your space. This is this is like the place, the brewery-ish. Yep. So this is like tap room and brewery. How long have you been in this building? Well, uh, for just about two years, a little over two years. Okay. And was it like, was this the dream to like, to have like a brick and mortar, like a space where it was like yours and you were doing, like, was that like the actual dream or how did, like, how did, how do you get here? Like, what's the story here? Yeah. You want to take this one? Um, yeah. So do I need to like say who I am? No, I'll, I'll do all that oh, in the yeah. front end. <laughs> um, so, um, I started home brewing. Um, th this is the story of how it started. I'll be yeah, yeah. in that shell. Uh, I started homebrewing the month I graduated from college. Matt and I went to um, a small private Christian university here in Nashville uh, where beer is definitely not um, light. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I graduated. And, you know, when you graduate, you sort of disperse and you don't have that instant community that you have yeah. uh, that you do in college. And so we're trying to find something that would keep us together. Or, of course, you know, tw the fresh 21-year-olds who could, you know, drink beer publicly now is like, oh, let's make beer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, that was something that would we could have a rhythm to it um, that would bring us together, that we could do together. Yeah. Um, a lot of time, you know, guys need something to do together in order to spend time. So we, we decided to make beer. Um, huh. So from that, you know, we sort of you know, brewing once a month, and um, this idea of beer and community just started to evolve. We started naming beers. Um, we all had sort of, we came from a background that they started naming beers with what we were doing, huh. and uh, started making labels for the beers, and got some uh, attention, and we yeah. had, um, I had people sort of say, hey, this is a good idea, you should start something. And then um, eventually, like every home brewery, you're pining off beer because you're making so much beer. Um, I, um, Matt heard about what I was doing, and that was what I convinced, um, got Matt on board to join me with what I was doing. Um, were you both beer guys at the time? Or were you the beer guy and you were like the logistics? Like, how did, like, what was the partnership there? So Matt, Matt like, heard about me home brewing. And knew that I had this dream of starting a brewery. And of course, you know, it, we both like beer. And uh, <laughs> we're in business classes together. And it's actually our sister who gave us the uh, connection. Oh, cool. And so he's like, sure, let's do this. Yeah. Um, and so um, a couple months go by. Tyler and I were in a small group at church together. And of course, I'm giving them homebrew like every time we meet. <laughs> And um, like the favorite guy, yes, in the group, <laughs> yeah. And um, he's always supportive, he bought like a pint glass from me. And um, 
and uh, Tyler and I are b- brother-in-laws. At the time, we were not brother-in-laws. We later, huh. l- later became a uh, family. And um, wow. Matt and I were like, hey, we need one more guy. And I was like, and of course, he was talking to my sister. And I was like, okay, Katie, like, we need to try to convince Tyler to join this team. <laughs> and that's how the team sort of came about. So. That's very cool. So wait, is that, did you grow up around, like, brew culture? Like, well, like, how do you get into a place where, like, you graduate from, like, private Christian school where like people are like, yeah, don't drink, don't smoke, don't talk about people who do to like, you run a brewery. Like, yeah. like so was it like in, like it was in your family, it was just in your head. Like how do you, how do you come into a knowledge of yeah, like beer and brewing? That's a good question. A lot of people ask us, we're, we're come from the, the, the vein of Church of Christ, which is a small evangelical non-denominational denomination um, really based in the South and did not go, they, they do not like alcohol. They are very no, big in <laughs> the temperance movement. And so a lot of people ask us how a bunch of good old Church of Christ boys got into beer. <laughs> right. And uh, I got to tell them this big long story and I get a lot of church ladies, you know, questioning what I do <laughs> um, <laughs> and what we do. Um, but um, didn't grow up around beer, never really grew up around alcohol. Alcohol was not definitely something that was evil in my household. It just was something that wasn't talked about and yeah. wasn't done. And um, and I think um, I think uh, the craft movement has allowed an avenue, um, uh, and we could talk about that more. An avenue in which that we could get into beer and offered an alternative to what was to what the other alcohol culture there was yeah at the time um, so in other words like because it was about the craft and not like hey we're making beer broad like we're into booze we're gonna get boozy it was like hey there's an art to this thing yeah and it sort of opened the door to like this isn't just some dudes trying to get tanked yeah right. yeah. yeah yeah i think a lot of us like saw the opportunity to engage with people through um brewing beer, making beer, enjoying beer with others. Um, it kind of has this unique ability to bring people together um, and kind of open people up, have some really meaningful, enjoyable conversations that uh, go beyond surface level. Yeah. And so we wanted to be able to kind of contribute to that kind of community and yeah. see how far we could take it. And um, that's kind of why we went with like the brick and mortar approach to have a tap room um, because we didn't want to just make the beer. We wanted to create a space for people to, you know, engage with one another. Um, I think COVID has really uh, exposed the need for human interaction huh. more so than I, at least I knew. Like I was like, okay, everything's going to go digital. Like that's just the way the world's moving. And then COVID happened. And then I realized like Zoom meetings are not the end all be all. Like you got to have human interaction. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we really just wanted to make a space that could allow for that to happen. That's good. When, like, when you went to like create the space, was was there a vision for like? Uh, it sounds like the primary thing was actually putting people in a room to like be together, right. and the right. beer is like a, it's like a, um, it's, it's a like tool. a magnet. Yeah, it's, so, yeah. It's a, we've always said it's like a vehicle that brings people together. It's not the end all be all. It's just the thing that starts the other things of community so the conversation the community right. the people being together is the right. thing is is the thing that drives your yeah. culture so we want we want to create beers that are creative and unique that have elements in them that are special themselves that people will talk about but then relate it to something that's a little deeper or meaningful that they can you know that there's depth to what we're creating that drives these deeper conversations between people the, the beer itself the beer itself. Give, an ex- give me an example um well the best one well, Nate can probably speak to these the best, but our, uh, tell them about like eighth day or... or. Yeah, I guess so. Th- this is how I look at, how we look at beer and brewing. Beer is our tool and our canvas in order to tell stories. So we, I look at our jobs as telling stories and we, we need to think about what kind of stories, what kind of narrative do we want to tell the world? And we want those stories and those narratives to be about life and love and community and faith and doubt and pain and, and the hmm. human existence. These stories is what really 
brings people together and what can um, bond that community. It's when you can share a story and you can learn and you learn someone else's story. You, you see them as you see their humanity yeah, and, and what they are. So um, there's so many exam, examples so, um, that we want to tell about, um, about those things. And one example, I think what God has connected to you and with your prayer of the beloved, I'm a big fan of Henry Nowen. Yeah. His book called Life of the Beloved is a gorgeous letter written to the world saying, hey, you are the beloved and your prayer, your little prayer really encapsulates yeah. that great, that great meaning. Hmm. And it's that idea that beer um, and the table and for us, the bar is a place where people, no matter who they are, are welcome and come come to sit. So we say for us to share a beer is to break bread with someone. And to break bread with someone is a sign of peace and a sign of fellowship. So we tell people we want to share a beer with you. That means we want fellowship with you. We want you a part of this community. Yeah. Um, and so that's why beer is that big important tool to, to help us create this vision and make our our little piece of the world a little bit better and a little bit more we'll love. That's good. Um, I love that. Yeah. It's it's a trip too because it's like when folks like it's almost like there shouldn't there shouldn't be that gap right in terms of like what like what booze or what beer can be in terms of social interaction. There is though like but you know when we when folks say like hey let's go, you know we're gonna have a conversation with someone they'll say something along the lines of like hey let's get a coffee. Or right. let's get a drink, mm-hmm. yeah. right? right? Yeah. But then, like you know, in in general conversation around like like whether it's coffee brewing or whether it's uh, or whether it's beer or whiskey or whatever, like there's not there there isn't often that much. Uh, how's it? I, I don't off I don't often hear that much intentionality, at least like peripherally, to like the making to the to the craft of it. From the standpoint of like this is going to be facilitating a relationship, so this it's a like I love the collision, I love the intentionality. Yeah. yeah. So the, yeah. Th- so how we one way that that this idea you know this is very high, the way that we can make that practical is that first we 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 make a statement and we get this from a guy named Wendell Berry. He's an author and act uh, activist. Um, a farmer up in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. I swear to call him the patron saint um, of the of the small American farm. Um, I'm not sure that you read any of oh, his yeah. stuff. It's, we, we, I call him the patron saint of our brewery as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he has a statement where he says, to eat is an agricultural act. And so we translate that by saying, to drink is an agricultural act. Hmm. So we're making an agricultural product. And a lot of people want to... They think about beer, they think it's stainless steel and whatnot, but we want people to think about the soil. And Wendell Berry says, the health of the soil is the health of the community. And we are all about community. So we're, take, we're making something that comes from the ground. We want to make sure it comes from the ground around us. Wow. And basically what, what you can really sum up a lot of what Wendell Berry said is one of the best ways that you can love your neighbors. And a lot of people don't think about, uh, think about it, like this is that one of the best ways you can love your neighbors is to buy local. And really now more than ever, and that makes more sense in the time that we're in, but to buy local is a great way to love your neighbor Yeah. because they're right next to you and they need that just as much as you do. And so Bindu Berry is all about this creation, all about this creation of regional and local economies, and we want to be a part of that. We see ourselves good. as a processor, and we want to connect – the farmer to the end consumer. And so, um, and we could get into like what I call the theology of, you know, creation. I call it beer theology and yeah. all that kind of stuff. But um, so the way that we do this, that we help create these intentional communities, is that we, do, we make a truly hyper local beer. So we use 100% all local grain. I'm on the farm every other day. I'm on the phone every other day with farmers and growers, seeing what's in season, what they're planting, what's in harvest, hmm. so that I can we can make a beer that really represents the place where it's at, and huh. it's a gift that I get to see people who grow our beer drinking beer alongside the people who are enjoying 
enjoying it as well wow. and that they get to know the name or the story or the place where their beer actually comes from and it's again a way that we can create this community is we are creating something that is organic yeah that that's really is good. from the ground so then um, take me talk, talk about like uh it, folks oftentimes they get into to like some phase where they, they get the shop up they get the, they've got the tap room and then like the dream gets bigger and there's like the distribution part of things mm -hmm. do you have like long-term like dreams in terms of like hey like multiple locations is distribution like on the table like Talk about like is distribution on the table. How do you go about that? And then and how do you maintain the sense of locality and sense of place? Because that's Wendell Berry's thing, right? The whole yeah. Jaber Crow story yeah. is like you live where you live. The car is an enemy. <laughs> like it's you know like you know having a sense of place. You belong where you belong. You live where you live. You're in touch with you know with the world in which you live. How do you maintain a sense of like locality and and place? while like thinking about expansion and distribution with a product like this like, what's that right. look like yeah so that's actually a big part of our you know planning and thinking right now is like we we see distribution as a way to bring people back to this place huh. so we know that our for our brand to grow and for our business to grow that you know not everybody's going to be able to drive or come to this space on a regular basis uh, to support us because, um, you know, people are busy with COVID quarantine. They need to stay yeah. where they live. So they're not always going to be, we're not always going to be accessible for foot traffic. So uh, we know distribution and getting our, our product outside of these walls and into stores and restaurants and bars yeah. is, is necessary to bring people back here. But that's how we've always seen it as we, we put our product out there, but the end goal is to, to find a way to bring them back. Huh. to our brick and mortar uh, and the long-term vision is to create a few local like spaces in different communities that it becomes a cornerstone in a different place and around the city and eventually we'd love to have like a a farm brewery like find a piece of land wow that we can work with growers to come grow on that land use that in our beer and have a have a space that is you have to come there to experience it. Yeah. And, and when you're there, you're experiencing that location and that, uh, you know, at that, that place. So, yeah. um, so we're still figuring out how that, how that's going to, cause you're, you're how old now? Two As years. We've been open two yeah. years. Yeah. That's a lot of movement in two years. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it's, you know, it's, we're not sure how the, all that's going to play out, but we've always seen distribution as, something we're going to do but it's not to get become a regional or national brewery where we're just pumping out beer and yeah. getting it all over the place it's it's very intentional about connecting people with our product so that they want to come and come to this space and, and experience one of, it here one of the things that's fascinating to me about like about beer culture specific uh i think it's true like booze culture to some degree in general but like is like you know it where I live, Martinez, uh, east of Oakland, California, town called Concord, where I grew up. Uh, right downtown, there was a, a a place called EJ Fair, and it was you know it was brewery, pub, restaurant, and it was like the spot in downtown Concord. And then this other uh, this other joint uh, called um, I'm going to blank on the name of the place, a Hop Grenade, like they popped up. And then right across from Hop Grenade, uh, this you know tower brewery, or whatever. And like no one was bummed. What was fascinating is like it's it's not like other like food or coffee cultures where it's like you know you've got your spot over here in the corner, and then another coffee shop opens up across the way, and people are like ooh, there was this collaborative like oh cool yeah yeah like there's like rad that's awesome that these guys are over here. There really is this like you're like you're sitting and wearing an Avery Brewing uh, Avery Brewing cap. Yep. <laughs> um, there really isn't as much a sense of like competition among like breweries or like beer makers. There is like a, there's, there's a little bit more of a collaborative kind of thing. I, 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 or at least from the outside, it seems that way that like there's like brewer, you know, brewers and beer makers, tap rooms, like are kind of in it together. Like, what is that? What is that about? Like, why aren't you fighting? 
Like what? Like where? Where are the fist fights among the beer people? Like what? Yeah. Like what's that about? No, I, I think um, part of that is that like if you're if you're trying to get into making beer to make money, you're doing the wrong thing. Huh. So I think that's part of it is that you know a lot of people who start the breweries um, oftentimes are just looking for the next thing. Like they're burnt out from corporate America um, and they want to go do something that they enjoy. Um, and so it is kind of like a labor of love. And so like we all know how difficult it is to start a brewery. And so we want to be able to help other people who are also running their breweries or starting their breweries. So it's not like like it's a we know how hard it is. So we want to make it easier for other people. So if there's any knowledge or um, ingredients that we can share so we can because we're small. Um, if we work with other breweries in town to buy in larger quantities, yeah, we can actually see some better economies there. Um, and so really like we're all in this to, um, just watch our businesses grow and yeah. they're, they're all kind of just family businesses. Um, and a lot of things that are, I like to think that like all of craft beer is kind of competing against the more macro beer okay so the uh, the anheuser-busch the coors miller coors um, so if any if all craft beer is winning then everyone kind of gets to ride the wave that's good um so i think that's why there's a lot of camaraderie a lot of collaboration um and there is competition just not um in a kind of like a going for blood and kind of competition like everyone wants to brew the best beer right yeah. Um, so everyone's like, oh, I'm going to compete to make sure that my IPA is better than the guy down the road. But it's because we want to drink good IPAs. It's not yeah. because I want to put the other guy out of business. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. And there's this idea of like, I guess in a lot, when you think of competition, you think of like feast or famine. Like you're either winning and you're and you're and somebody else is losing. But I think in craft beer, everybody kind of looks at it as there's space at the table for everybody. And everybody's yes. bringing something different. And if the guy down the street's being successful, that means people are coming to that area for beer. And when they've tried his beer and then they hear there's another brewery that they can go visit that's close by, yes. then they're coming to that brewery next and they're going to try that beer. So it's really, there's there's room in for everybody. I think craft beer really believes that and sees that. And that's why you can have cities like Asheville, North Carolina, where you're in a one part of town and there's 10 breweries that are all walking distance from each other and they're all doing something unique and different right that draws a different crowd but most of the time people are going to go and hit up every spot yes and so yeah there's yeah it's not fun- there, the culture doesn't function from from like a like a scarcity mindset right but like there's right. only so people will only try so many beers right. <laughs> or beer, beer, beer folks are like no 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 yeah. Like, right. how many beers are there? Like, yeah. how, and how much time do I have? I mean, right. the, like, what was the, it's a place, um, what's it, Flying Saucer? Is that, right. like, yeah. they've got, like, whatever, 200 some odd beers on tap right. or whatever it is. And, like, you get the tag, and, and the goal is to try, try all, all of them. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And that's, like, th- that, you know, the, the scarcity mindset that runs so much other kind of culture it really does seem generally absent. Right. From brew culture. Right. Which is pretty great. And it's it's fun because it's like you definitely get your regulars who they pick out your brewery as that's going to be my home base. Yeah. But then they're still going out and trying things, but then they come back here because this is, you know, maybe we do a beer that they really like or a style that they really like, but it doesn't mean that they're, you know, closed off to these other yeah. breweries in town. Talk about primary obstacles, like in, so in terms of like uh, becoming a brewery, making beer, creating a, like a beer culture. Are there are there things that like have been like dominant in terms of like here's an obstacle we have to we have to deal with? Are there like what what are what are the things that might be like distinctive in terms of here's what's here's what's hard about being a brewery? Well, in the South, it's it's. The government, it's the mm-hmm. laws that are still in place from an era that's, you know, far gone, but, but you know, out of prohibition, laws. prohibition yeah. and things. So, that have like, just, yeah. so, for, so folks would hear that, right? And be right. like, oh, weird. Like, how does that affect you? So give me yeah, an example. So, like, why, so, is it, why is it weird? Why is it hard? So in Tennessee, uh, no, it's steady. It's really a 
study where there's a study where someone did a study one time where there's really a indirect correlation between the number of Baptist churches in a state and the number of breweries. <laughs> so the more Baptist churches, the lower the breweries. The more breweries, the lower the Baptist churches. <laughs> so like, just think of that at face value and where them, like where are the amount of breweries. Now this is probably like eight, you know, year, eight years ago, but still, huh. still somewhat true. But think of where craft beers popped up. Really, it's exploded on the West Coast. It's, it's exploded on the coastal lines, and it's slowly made it made its way inward. So you have again, that's like that relationship to like religion and culture and faith and and alcohol and beer is still at play, yeah. especially in places in the South like Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia. Yeah, isn't the Southern Baptist Convention based in Nashville, so yeah, part of it, yeah. <laughs> so it's it's like a, it's an actual like legitimate like it's not just like a kind of cute notion. It's an actual right. obstacle. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean like a a very tangible way that this plays out is that. Um, brewers and uh, breweries cannot distribute outside of their county unless they work with a distributor. And so that immediately takes uh, margin off of your uh, product, which makes it more and more, which makes it more difficult to grow your business. Yeah. So that's just one is like, that's a very antiquated law. There's lots of other states that allow the statewide distribution. Um, and so that's just one example of... So in other words, to get your beer out of your own county, you kind of have to give the government a cut. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. In, well, by way, well you, have to, you have to give a third party, a, a distributor, who's going to be your middleman between you and the retailer, and then they get to take their cut out of it. What's the intention of the law? Like, what, what, what's that's the intention the, of the law? Well, it goes like, back to that... The, the beer. Right. The alcohol <laughs> well, out of prohibition the biggest breweries that survived basically went into distribution. So they helped form laws that made it requirement for a brewery to use a distributor. So that's part of it. And then it's just the culture. It's like, yeah, they haven't really done much to change it because here in the South, you know, it's kind of, you know, you have a lot of people through the temperance movement and stuff that are trying to just limit how much alcohol can be yeah. shifted around, but it's, you know, it hasn't really, made much of a difference because it's still like you know whiskey is huge here right? yes and, yeah. Yeah. it really is you know just you know and beer is catching on um i just think you know it's it's taken longer just because like we learned like you know there are a lot of people that are like man i wish i could start a brewery and you're like well, why aren't there more breweries there's a lot of people that say they want to start them but then we started down that path and realized wow it's really hard because you got to have so much upfront capital just to get you have to to get your permit just to make the beer to sell it, you have to have everything built and in place so that they can come and inspect it before you've ever made a drop to sell. And yeah. uh, so it's it's kind of a, you know, there are other states where you can you could start home brewing and sell your home brew out of the back of your house and be a brewery. And so there's no upfront investment other than your home brew equipment. And your equipment, yeah. Yeah, but here it's like you got to put up half a million, a million dollars, or a couple million dollars before you can even make a product to, to huh. sell. Yeah. So that, that that was probably the biggest hurdle because that takes time and it takes yes. a lot of money. And so and it's a massive risk. Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 So you got to convince a lot of people. You got to convince you know, investors. You got to convince our families. You got to convince your lawyer, the state, city, um, bank. bank. I mean, you got to convince your landlord that this is all a viable option. So... You have to cast this vision for a lot of different people and have them buy into it. So, That's good. Which is a lot of work. Talk about, so this this specific season, March 2020, I mean, you guys are like, you're two years old. There's kind of this momentum thing that happens. You kind of like normally takes between two and three years for, for a culture like this to really catch. People kind of be like, oh, this is my spot. <laughs> March 2020 hits. Yep. And the pandemic begins, there's a virus, you have to close your doors off and on. Like, talk about navigating this, uh, this season, namely because if, if the name of the game for you isn't just like to make great beer, that's, that's an element of it. If the name of the game for you is community, connection, relationship, like that's the thing that, that is being squashed. Right. So what's, what's it look like 
what has it looked like for you to navigate this season since March as a brewery that's trying to put people together in a room to drink beer and connect? Yeah, it's been it's been very difficult. Um, sucks. Yeah. It sucks. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah. I mean, we've had to come up with new ways to get um, beer into the market. So we, like before March, we weren't doing really any bottling. Um, but now we've moved into a couple of different bottling methods. Um, hmm. So we've tried to encourage people, you know, to, to grab beer and go home um, and that they can still have community with their family at home or with neighbors on the porch, whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that it, it really makes what we're trying to do not possible because, you know, having people in the location is the primary goal. And when the location is no longer a safe place to be, it's like we can't do what we want to do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been, it's been really difficult. Not only uh, from a business perspective, but also, at least for me personally, like a moral, a morale perspective as well. Yeah, because yeah. you don't have people in the room and you're not watching yeah, just, as many people yeah. Yeah. try the beer. Yep. Yeah, really this time period, you know, we're, right, we're in early December and so like we're in the middle of Advent. Really, since March 2020 has been a year of Advent. It's been a huh. year of anticipation and waiting that we've lost we're missing this this connection, this community, this wholeness um, that we're just can't that we're just so we, we anticipate it so much. We, we we just need to wait, and to really like I, I look at this time, this I guess this this time of isolation as as the the darkness of, of Advent, and so for us it's been a really um, a lesson in that that yeah. we can savor and appreciate um those that time gathered around the table and the bar around huh. the beer around the creation that much more it'll be that much sweeter um because of this holy anticipation that we've been going through um during this time since march yeah so that's really good um let's say you know things play out and things go well. Let's you know you know right now there's you know sort of the pandemic ramping up again and like shutdowns are at least where I'm in California. Mm -hmm. I just got a text from my wife that um, the, the the governor of California is deciding somehow I don't know how you enforce this, but like you can't have pretty much you can't have gatherings in your own house. Like you can't have, you can't have like grandma or aunts and uncles over. They just you're kind of shutting stuff down across the board. You know, the the season passes, you, the things come back around, folks be able to come back. What's it look like? What does success long term look like for you? So for Harding House, 15 years from now, if things work the way you want them to, what it, what will success mean? Like, how will you mark success? What are the metrics you'll use? What will it mean for you to have been a successful brewery 15 years from now? I think for me, it's... Uh like i i got into this not because i i love beer so much that i needed to make it i it's really cuz i love Nate and i love his vision that i wanted to see it be successful and for so for me success is that this is a viable business that supports people's livelihood where they get to come in and and practice their craft yeah and make a living off of it and live well through it and like i see like our bar staff and our our brewing staff as like this is something that they can do as a career and they can support their families and that that to me is success is that we're we're allowing other people to do something yeah. and provide a job and a livelihood and create that kind of community as a team and a, and and because if if we're able to do that then that means we're doing our job well bringing people together and yeah. and do making good beer which so that for me personally is just this is a a career that people can that's good live off of so yeah like then that. i would say to add to that i think 15 years from now i would like to see us be a catalyst for more like local ingredients being grown hmm. and supported so that not only are we supporting our staff and creating solid jobs that way but we're also supporting you know the local agriculture um that are and the farmers that are using um, good farming practices 
uh, to not mass produce but really partner with the earth as opposed to take from it and i would like to see our business be um a very strong contributor to the need for that type of farming yeah. and that type of agriculture it's beautiful yeah i'll probably second what matt's saying is that i so that's gonna be we've been a player in the sort of a, a, a um like a, a grandfather and a father in this sort of regional economy that is around Tennessee and yeah. the Southeast. And um, if people can see us as a, um, a creator of that, um, then like that would be success for me. One, a, a good quality product. And of course, we, we need to be making money to make it sustainable. Um, but also that we're just, we are um, creating um, good stuff and, you know, and creating these regional and uh, local economies yeah. all around us. So, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you guys for your time. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, it for, great. thanks for coming. In the park near my house is a series of trails that intersect a small creek in a few spots. And in the winter, that creek rises and it's almost impossible to cross at one location. So a few years ago, someone built a bridge over that spot. They saw a problem and they created a solution in order to address it. Then a week or so later, someone else tore it down. And then in response, the original builder took some of the broken pieces from the first bridge and used them to assemble a new bridge. And I think that's actually how life works and moves forward, which is why I wrote that story into my next book entitled, It Is What You Make Of It. 15 stories that push back against the kind of it is what it is thinking that keeps us from entering into the world around us and living fully. The book comes out on June 1st. You can pre-order it now. I hope you do. And thank you for listening to this episode of the At Sea Podcast. If you would like to follow up with and keep track of the Harding House team, you can jump to hardinghousebrew.com. It's H-A-R-D-I-N-G, Harding, and then house is, well, house. And brew is B-R-E-W, hardinghousebrew.com. From there, you can go find them at Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. They've got a great online store with some really, really cool swag. If you want to buy a beer from them, you got to be in Nashville, Tennessee, and it's a great spot. If you would like to follow up with and keep track of and support this podcast, jump to patreon.com and search my name, Justin McRoberts. We would love to have you on our team. Until next time.